I locked my jaw, furrowed my brow hard, and thumped him right in the heart. Unblinking, I told him, you are a man. Do you believe that? And then tears stream down his cheeks. His head falls low. His glance darts left to right. These were dangerous words, and he didn't want to get caught considering them. He'd been a good little gelding, always going to his stall when he was told, but this invitation to be a stallion again seemed almost illegal. He'd been wounded by his father, and his father couldn't give him the masculine affirmation that he didn't have himself. And now, in a culture that downright vilifies biblical masculinity, but needs it more than ever, this simple act of calling a man a man was like giving him an invitation to the underground Sons of Liberty's protest in December of 1773. As he considered the idea for a moment, as he tried the concept on for size, it awakened a dormant flame in his heart that scared him. Such fire is forbidden in the feminist fraught world. Today, to give a man permission to be a man is forbidden, but I could see that sense of injustice wash over his tear-laden face. Who has the authority to forbid this? And then the rusty barb of insecurity and doubt lodged in his heart by the enemy snagged. So he winced, he turned away. And then the fire takes hold. And he looks me in the eye for the very first time, truly looks me in the eye for the first time. And I can see that fire when he answers, yes. I do not describe just one man in this story. I describe the exact same moment that I have witnessed three feet away from my face over 50 times in my ministry career so far. There are countless men among us whose hearts have been demolished and whose masculine flame is just a flickering ember now, but I believe God wishes to fan it into flame once more. That fire is good. As a disclaimer, the scripture we're going to look at today deals with very mature themes. So, As another reminder, now is a good time to put on your earbuds and direct your children to the online resources provided by HCC Kids. You see, we're going to call out passive and self-interested man-children, tell them to wake up. This church is full of godly women who are tired of waiting for you to wake up, sleeping men. We have godly men of Highlands who have been alive and on fire for a long time, but we have other men that I believe God is going to wake up. For context, we're going to see in this reading an altered iteration of the book of Proverbs interpretive key in 1.9. Proverbs 9.10 reads, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. We're going to introduce the aspects of Proverbs that speak directly to men, set up the overall introduction for this incredible book and the metaphorical woman wisdom's final discourse in chapter 9, and then survey in rapid-fire fashion selections from chapter 10, and then use those like a defibrillator to men's hearts. Now, ladies, you too will have a sermon from Proverbs that will apply more directly to you, but we will save that sermon, the very best sermon in the series, for the last chapter of Proverbs. You will be the grand finale just as you were upon all of creation itself. First, though, it's time to bring the dead men to life. How many women tired of the deadbeat men in your life not living up to all that God has designed them to be just said, amen, go ahead, Jesse. I wish you were here. Stay tuned. We have plans in motion. Let's look at the book of Proverbs, the word of God. Beginning, chapter 5. Verse 11, at the end of your life, you will lament when your physical body has been consumed, and you will say, how I hated discipline, and how my heart despised correction. I didn't obey my teachers or listen closely to my instructors. I'm on the verge of complete ruin before the entire community. Listen to the regret in the proverbial old man's voice. Smell his bitterness as he laments his lack of self-awareness and the way he despised correction. This is not far from what Solomon would actually become himself when he wrote Ecclesiastes. Does it describe you right now? Do you utterly despise correction? I remember my first gut check sitting in a conference room, realizing that I was not actually as smart as I thought I was, not actually as successful as I thought I was. I remember the color palette of the carpet, a mixture of crimson with royal hues. 
But armed with that self-awareness, I left the room and could actually become the man of God I wanted to be because of that correction. Do not despise correction because when you're incorrect without realizing it, correction will save you from the beleaguered destiny of becoming a sour old man embittered by regret, wishing that he had just heeded correction, obeyed his teachers, and listened closely to his instructors. This is that moment. I am that instructor. The Bible is that correction. Masculinity is in a state of ruin right now. Critical theory an academically nuanced version of cultural Marxism, purports that Christian males are at the top of a hierarchy and therefore privileged in a way that means that you, in the name of social justice, must be taken down several notches. So it is culturally virtuous to disparage you on the basis of your gender, even if the Supreme Court is not quite sure what gender is right now. And it is especially virtuous if you are a cisgender, straight, male Christian who happens to be white. You might as well be the devil in a world that ironically doesn't believe in the devil. My baby girl is flourishing. She has more superheroines and female protagonists and feminist icons to admire than any generation of little girls before her in history. Fly high, little princess, our TV tells her, and it is beautiful. Boys are not being celebrated at all right now, though. My boys have to rein in their instincts at school. They're in an educational system that is run by amazing people, but whose playbook rewards little boys for conducting themselves like well-mannered little girls and punishes them for acting like vigorous, active, tactile, learning little boys. As a result, boys in general are falling behind in school. The Me Too movement exposed the hypocrisy, especially of men in the Hollywood elite, and it taught me a great deal. I learned about my own wife's experiences growing up in a world fraught with sexually predacious men being spoken to inappropriately by customers at Chick-fil-A and more. However, the Me Too movement also unfairly painted a target on some men's backs when they have done nothing wrong, counting it even virtuous to sweep some wrongfully accused innocent men into the coal alongside the actual offenders. I worry for my sons. Toxic masculinity points out predacious behaviors as obviously wrong, but it is a deeply derogatory term that blankets over good masculine attributes as well. Harry's Razors released an ad crossing out, be a rock, be a man, be tough, be the breadwinner, calling good things bad, not just bad things bad. Bette Midler proudly tweeted, men and religion are worthless and was widely celebrated for it. Just imagine for a moment a man tweeting that women are worthless. This is the world in which my sons are growing up. According to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, men are 3.56 times more likely to commit suicide than women. Some emasculated men are all too happy to self-flagellate, kowtowing lower and ever lower to the endless demands of new wave feminists. I've read multiple articles that spread the blame for rape, even to chivalrous men who have never even had the thought cross their minds, accusing them of tacit contribution to a pervasive rape culture and attacking the innocent for the crimes of the guilty. It's very in vogue right now to tear down the hero. And so cowardly men have seemingly justified their aversion to heroics. These recent cultural thought trends from critical theory to me too to rape culture make the idea of a sermon trying to rally men to be men all the more risky. I pray that I am not misunderstood. Bloggers, I'm responsible for what I say. You are responsible for what you say I say. Because of these things, we need men to be men more than ever. Many young men are retreating The demarcations of manhood and generations past are gone. Get married, be a good husband, raise your kids. Yes, children need both their mothers and their fathers together. Provide. Instead, young men are satisfying their sexual appetites through surrogate video experience, satisfying their need for adventure through surrogate video games. Wake up, Walter Mitty! 
and choosing to live lives of self-indulgence instead of self-sacrifice. The ultimate axiom of masculinity personified by Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Wake up, men! Wake up! As a result of this result, men are abdicating self-discipline. The refining effect that marriage once had on a man is being lost. It is easier to just earn what you need to pay for your Xbox Live subscription, finance your V6 Mustang or your Prius, and either rent a studio apartment or just live with mom and dad for longer years than any generation of men on record. Where are the men who stormed Normandy Beach? A man in his 30s who lived with his parents strutted up to me. His mom once had a meeting with me to explain his behavior following an incident when he lashed out at a leader in the church. Apparently, he is gifted in a way that I could never understand, so colossally intelligent that he's too smart to be hired and or kept by any employer anywhere, and that she was certain he had an idea that would cure cancer. This woman was completely serious. She had trained her son to interpret all of his negative interactions as proof that he was vastly superior in intelligence to everyone around him. This supposed evidence for his confirmation bias was abundant. A quick aside to the moms. If you choose to mother your boy forever, you just might succeed. Like Dr. James Dobson writes, there has to come a time when he steps into his father's world primarily, and that cannot happen if you constantly hover over him, fight his battles for him, clean up after him, make excuses for him, and contribute to his self-aggrandizing delusions. So this undiscovered genius swaggered up to me and asked if I could meet with him for an hour a week to debate theology with him. I told him I would do that only if he would send me a photo of his alarm clock going off before 9 a.m. each day and send me proof that he had applied for either jobs, schooling of some sort, or the military before I would meet with him. He wanted to use me to contribute to his false narrative about himself. The story his mother ingrained in him about him was that he was an undiscovered genius. Have you, have you ever felt this about yourself, that You could succeed if it were not for the utter inferiority of all the people in power over you. He he wanted his story to be, I'm a genius who's going to cure cancer. I'm too intelligent for trade school or college, and I occasionally defeat my pastor in theological debate. I refuse to contribute to that delusion. With these parameters asking him to, you know, get up before nine, he was no longer interested in meeting with me about theology because it was never about the theology. He is finally taking measures to stop living in a sinful lack of discipline. Proverbs 26, 16, in his own eyes, a slacker is wiser than seven men who can answer sensibly. Now, there are not many such men at Highlands Community Church, but there are some, and I want to talk to them right now. Okay, look at me. You are a man. It's time. It's time. Look at what is coming in the sixth chapter of Proverbs, and let it convict you into action, if you will. Proverbs 6, 6, go to the ant, you slacker. Observe its ways and become wise. Without leader, administrator, or ruler, it prepares its provisions in summer. It gathers its food during harvest. How long will you stay in bed, you slacker? This is the word of God. When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the arms to rest. And your poverty will come like a robber, your need like a bandit. Now, we've arrived at verse 15. You, Highlands Community Church, you stood by me when I've preached against abortion. You've stood by me when I preach Romans 1 and Genesis 18 and 19. I'm going to ask you to stand by me again as I preach this text, which is sexual in nature. It is the inspired Word of God. I will say what it says, and I will not mitigate it at all. Save your angry emails and submit to the Word of God. This is verse 15. 
drink water from your own cistern, water flowing from your own well. The word cistern here refers quite tastefully and eloquently to the intimacy life of a husband and wife. Sex. In ancient Israel and even today, people collected rainwater in cisterns. They could retrieve water from a community well or from their own private well or fountain. You see the tasteful parallel here as Solomon is obviously not talking about water. Okay, just wait until the explicit nature of verses 18 and 19 if you doubt me. Let's start in verse 15 with the word drink because it is important. Indeed, drink, husbands. This is a biblical call to drink deeply of intimate love in the context of marriage. Drink up, married couples. The text tells us to drink. Christianity has the unfair reputation of being anti-sex when we actually have the market cornered on good sex. Guaranteed disease-free sex for those who abstain until marriage. Sex that is holy, even called for by God in this first word of this verse. And sex whose results not consequences, which though it's not really fair, grammatically often has a negative connotation, whose results, sex whose results are God-honoring and literally life-giving. This just in, sex is exactly what we do when we're trying to conceive children. So while there is total freedom in the marriage bed, and the commissioning to be fruitful and multiply is ours to heed, to postpone, or decline as we will, If an unplanned pregnancy results in the context of a marriage, the outcome is always beautiful because all babies are beautiful. So drink up, married couples. A survey of sexual satisfaction yielded results that embarrassed the research team. Married Christians have far and away the best satisfaction in their sex lives because everything is genuinely better God's way. So again, drink up, married couples. In verse 15, The words, your own, are also obviously operative in this verse. Do drink, but drink obviously from your own cistern. Verse 16, should your springs flow in the streets, streams in the public squares? Should your passion for your bride be wasted? No, it is a good and God-honoring thing. Your intimacy should not flow in the streets or streams in the public squares. Okay, look at me. There is no such thing as an open marriage. Verse 17. They should be for you alone and not for you to share with strangers. Let your fountain be blessed and take pleasure in the wife of your youth. Yes, the Holy Spirit just used the word blessed to describe God's will for your intimacy with your wife. Now, if this comes as a surprise to you, just wait until the non-Disney rated book we're going to study next, Song of Songs. Now, look to verse 19 with me. A loving deer, a graceful doe, let her breasts always satisfy you. Be lost in her love forever. By be lost in her love forever, Solomon uses a word translated lost that is elsewhere used to describe intoxication or even contexts referring to sin as though a man were completely given over to his sins. In this sense, however, be lost in her love forever, it takes on a beautifully godly connotation. Be intoxicated in your sex life with your bride, man. Be lost in the throes of God-anointed, holy and righteous lovemaking with the woman for whom you made a covenant with God to sacrifice yourself and be rapturously lost in this heart-satisfying sex forever, the text says. Pastors historically blush when they read these words, let her breasts always satisfy you, but I'm going to emphasize the word her to the glory of God, men who look at pornography. These words are written about your wife. Let her breasts satisfy you. So if you have a wife, be wholly satisfied in her. If you don't have a wife, Go find one immediately. Proverbs 18, 22, a man who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. 
to unmarried widows. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul wrote, but if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. I'm going to point at the word satisfy in verse 19. Men whose lusts destroy your marriages because of your adultery. Be satisfied. There is absolutely no other worldview that makes such a promise or issues such a call. This calls for a life of intimacy between man and wife that actually satisfies you. There's nothing in this secular or sexular, if you will, world that could satisfy you. Rather, your wasted passions will reap a whirlwind of destruction that affects not just the woman with whom you're having an affair, not just her husband and kids, not just your wife and your kids, but the men in your small group to whom you have been lying. If God called you to this, there's a reason for it. Your sin affects God's church, so come clean of it today. Repent from your adultery right now. Take out your phone and watch the shackles of your sin fall as you confess. I'm going to emphasize now the word always to the glory of God. Be satisfied. At last, be satisfied in your own holy marriage always. I called for a baby boom back in January. Now get to work to the glory of God, married couples of Highlands Community Church. Moving on, verse 20. Why, my son, would you lose yourself with a forbidden woman or embrace a wayward woman? Do you see the contrast between losing yourself to your bride, verse 19, and losing yourself with a forbidden woman, verse 20? When you lose yourself to your bride, your marriage is stronger, which makes the church stronger when you lose yourself to a wayward woman. Not only could you take your marriage and possibly another marriage down a path that destroys some marriages and damages all the others, but you could father a child for whom you have created issues for which you will answer to God. Yeah, but Jesse, the women in the pornography that I consume don't see me. But your bride sees, man. And you're the very fool described in the book of Proverbs if you think that she can't tell when you have spent yourself elsewhere, ruining your body's ability to respond to your wife's body by consuming demonic pornography. A married father once told me that it was only on nights that he looked at pornography that his children woke up screaming with night terrors. Proverbs 9, 17. Stolen water is sweet and bread eaten secretly is tasty, but your secret sin will be found out no matter how adept you are at covering your tracks and no matter how well you clean your browser history. There are demonic outcomes when you waste your passions on pornography. There are also ethical implications to being a willing party to the colossal industry of pornography, even if you don't pay for the pornography. Some, but not all of the women who are involved are willing parties to the production of these videos. Sex trafficking, the disclosure of private footage, and even rape contribute to the pornography industry. And every time you add to their view count, you contribute to its search engine optimization or SEO ranking and literally make it easier for your son to find. Why would you lose yourself with a forbidden woman? Why would you embrace a wayward woman? Why would you contribute to the demonic scourge that I have seen in my counseling destroy marriages and men? Pornography is Satan's greatest weapon right now against godly masculinity, and you contribute to it every time you lie, every time you indulge, and every time you rob your wife of your love by literally flushing your passion down the drain and forcing her against her wishes and without her knowledge to be compared against an impossible standard. Today, right now, establish accountability with all of your devices, downgrade to a dumb phone, if that's what God calls you to do, as I've seen more than one godly man here in my office do, and watch the sanctification come back in due time into your marriage as you are then satisfied in your bride and her body. Go to highlandcc.org slash accountability 
and learn more about online accountability today, whether you are single, married, male, or female, and find what my bride and I have, satisfaction to the glory of God being lost in the love of your marriage. Verse 21. For a man's ways are before the Lord's eyes, and he considers all his paths. Your ways are before the Lord's eyes, man. This applies to women as well, obviously. He sees all that we do. Verse 22. A wicked man's iniquities will trap him. He will become tangled in the ropes of his own sin. He will die because there's no discipline and be lost because of his great stupidity. When I was serving as the pastor on call at my church in Florida, an older woman walked in with her adult son following behind her with his head down. He was in his nurse's scrubs and his breath smelled like alcohol. I could relate. They sat down on my couch and it took a full 15 minutes for his mother to get him to speak. He was married, but his wife had invited her boyfriend to live with them. This other man at the wife's invitation invaded his home, sat at his table, literally took over his bed, and even had the gall to speak harshly to his children. Tacitly and pathetically passively, this husband just allowed all of it, but felt pitiful and emasculated. I told him, go home, stand in the front door of your house, and tell the man that you will punch him in the face if he takes one step into your home, and then do it. Even if he annihilates you, at least you'll get some shred of your manhood back. This was my pastoral counsel to him. His mother guffawed, horrendously offended. And anticipating that she would complain to the lead pastor of the church, I told the lead pastor everything I said. The lead pastor said, good job, man. When this beleaguered husband finally stood up for his children and confronted his wife, the invader and his bride went away together. He was granted full custody of his children and she eventually came back to him, but their marriage was restored when he actually gained the audacity to lead his family for once. For the first time in his life, he had respect. And it was amazing to see him transform from an utter milksop and literal cuckold, to borrow from the Shakespearean term, to an actual man. He was unrecognizable after that. Even in his voice and his posture, he was alive. Ephesians 5 tells husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church, and this man forgave his bride. At our last contact, it was like their family finally began when this man was restored. So, instead of rejecting correction and instruction, instead of being ruined, instead of being trapped by your own iniquities and your great stupidity, be a man already. Here's your alternative. What I propose is not a list of behaviors. It's not time for you to adhere to a stupid stereotype. Okay, you can love football and fail to be a man. You can eat steak for every meal and fail to be a man. You can bury your emotions and seriously fail to be a man because of that, actually. You, so forcing yourself to watch football whilst choking down a steak that you hate and emotions that your wife needs would actually make you into less of a man then before, you know, you feigned these masculine behaviors. So instead, instead, I propose a radical transformation of your heart by a work of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who embodied the ultimate standard for husbands who give themselves up for their brides, the way that Christ gave himself up for us. A wise warrior, Proverbs 24, 5, is better than a strong one and a man of knowledge than one of strength. Your wisdom and your knowledge begin right here through the Word of God. Look at Proverbs 9, 1 through 12. Wisdom has built her house. She has carved out her seven pillars. She has prepared her meat. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her female servants. She calls out from the highest points of the city, whoever is inexperienced, enter here. To the one who lacks sense, she says, come eat my bread and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave an experience behind and you will live. Pursue the way of understanding. The one who corrects a mocker will bring abuse on himself. The one who rebukes the wicked will get hurt. Don't rebuke a mocker or he will hate you. Rebuke the wise and he will 
love you. Rebuke the wise and he will love you. Instruct the wise and he will be wiser still. Teach the righteous and he will learn more. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Do you see that? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of it all. It was the beginning of knowledge in Proverbs 1.9. It's the beginning of wisdom as well right here in Proverbs 9.10. And knowledge of the Holy One is is understanding because you know the Holy One. You know where the universe came from. You know where life came from. You know where morality came from. And you know where it's going. All of understanding, all of knowledge, all of epistemology begins with the fear of the Lord by knowing the Holy One. Verse 11, for by me, wisdom says, your days will be many and, your, and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, you are wise for your own benefit. If you mock, you alone will bear the consequences. So, because you're a man of God, because you're a man of God, now alive in Christ by the power of the gospel, instead of being a broke and unemployed loser, you will earn a living and give to your church, enabling the ministries of Highlands. Proverbs 10, 4. Idle hands make one poor, but diligent hands bring riches. This is a sword my dad gave to me. Now I offer it to you. Because you're a man of God, now alive in Christ by the power of the gospel, instead of putting on a fake front, you will live with integrity that sets you free. Proverbs 10, 9. The one who lives with integrity lives securely, but whoever perverts his ways will be found out. Because you're a man of God, now alive in Christ by the power of the gospel, instead of virtue signaling what a woke bro you are during a time of cultural unrest or cowering in silence, you will express genuine love by the power of the gospel for people. Proverbs 10, 12, hatred stirs up conflicts, but love conquers all offenses, covers all offenses. Because you're a man of God, now alive in Christ by the power of the gospel, instead of being destroyed by pornography, you will be set free by the power of God and at last have your integrity in holiness. Proverbs 11.3, the integrity of the upright guides them, but the perversity of the treacherous destroys them. Proverbs 20, verse 11, even a young man is known by his actions, but whether his behavior is pure and upright, because you are a man of God, now alive by the power of the gospel, instead of failing in the real world, by, while succeeding in the virtual world, you will provide a beautiful life for your family. Proverbs 12.11, the one who works his land will have plenty of food, but whoever chases fantasies lacks sense. Because you are a man of God, now alive in Christ by the power of the gospel, instead of putting on airs, you will humbly prosper. Proverbs 13, 7, one who pretends to be rich. One pretends to be rich, but has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, but has abundant wealth. Because you are a man of God, now alive in Christ by the power of the gospel, instead of floundering in your insecurity as a man because your dad never affirmed you, you will start a new legacy and all of your sons and daughters will know that they are loved. Proverbs 14, 26, in the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence and his children have refuge. Because you're a man of God, now alive in Christ by the power of the gospel, instead of living a selfish life built around only your own needs and desires, you will join the mission of God and bless everyone around you. Proverbs 18, 1, one who isolates himself pursues selfish desires. He rebels against all sound wisdom. So, the legacy of the father wound hereby in the name of Jesus stops with you. You are a man. So wake up. Be a man of God. Wake up and be a man of God. Be who you were designed to be and watch the women and children in your life flourish in part because of it. That same flickering ember that I have seen in broken men's demolished hearts before can be fanned into flame. That fire is good. Let the godly fire rage and overcome evil with good, this good in this broken world. Wake up. Wake up, men. Wake up. Bring revival and let it start in your heart right now. It sounds good, right? But not so fast, my skeptical friend. 
We live in a moral universe, and that's been obvious to you, men and women alike, since your childhood. Indeed, this literally phenomenal book of Proverbs proves meta non-fictionally true, as the metaphorical lady of wisdom calls out to us from the very pages that describe her in Proverbs 1, 20 through 33, 3, 13 through 20, and chapters 8 and 9. In beautifully perfect consistency, we find ourselves back in Romans 1 in which man is without excuse because the divine power and timeless eternal nature of God are on full display in the ancient wisdom that we have uncovered today. If you think that this is good advice, you're absolutely right. However, if you plan to take God's wisdom and leave God behind, you are the very fool described in this text. Do not appropriate God's wisdom, but deny God himself. Proverbs 1.9 is the interpretive key to the whole book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The more wisdom that you amass from God's word without surrendering to God as Lord over your life, the more scripture that will rise up to condemn you on that day of judgment before God. Standing before the great white throne in the last days, when all of evil is forever reckoned before the righteous and holy perfect judge, you will not be able to claim ignorance of God's word because you have beheld its goodness today. So, my skeptical friend, would you proclaim God's words out to God? Indeed, be a man, be a man of God, be a woman of God, beginning right now. That drawing on your heart is the Holy Spirit of the Lord. And if you would right now confess with me John 3.16, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, John 14.6, and Romans 10.9, you will be saved, Romans 10.9 says. Pray with me right now, right now. God, I believe that you love the world so much that you gave your one and only son that if I would believe in him, I would not die but have everlasting life. And I confess that I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I confess that the wages of my sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I believe you, Jesus, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no way I can come to God the Father except through you, Jesus. So right here and now, drawn upon by the Holy Spirit of God that is bringing me to life, I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Would you say Jesus is Lord right now out loud? Just say it. Jesus is Lord. God, I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. Now, God, let me be saved. Let me be saved. Let me be saved. In Jesus' name.